Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the Sunday morning where the snow has returned to Leamington, Ontario. Uh, we have a few announcements that uh, some people would like to share. I'll invite uh, those folks to come up front. And uh, also, welcome to 2024. It's actually our first service for January 2024. It's good to see everyone gathered, and uh, we'll hear what's coming up in the next little while. Thank you, Chris. Happy New Year, everybody. So our Credence and Company workshop is half over. We had a really, really full day yesterday. It was a wonderful um, workshop. It uh, even was fun at times. We had some laughter. And it was certainly very informative, uh, almost information overload, but that's good because it gives us lots of resources that we can work with then. So thank you to Betty Priest from Credence and Company. Uh, she led us yesterday. She'll be serving us this morning with the message. And then we will have lunch. And I'm told there is lots of lunch ordered, so please stay. And also then we have the afternoon session right after that. And even if you haven't been able to attend yesterday, please uh, stay today if you're able to. So um, Betty is a congregational health specialist and uh, she brings 30 years of uh, experience to the conversation and uh, we have lots to learn. Um, we feel too with, with our hope and with our faith that we can be authentic and kind as we answer God's call to where he is leading North Leamington United Mennonite Church. Thank you. Good morning. A um, little update on the behalf of the personnel team. Uh, Susan Clausen, our church secretary slash custodian, has uh, wanted to free up a little bit more of her family time, and so she has uh, decided to give up her caretaking duties. So, phew, that she didn't say her uh, bookkeeping duties as well. So, um, but uh, we really uh, appreciate Susan's hard and dedicated work over the many years. She began her caretaking duties with her husband, Harry, I'm thinking six or seven years ago, roughly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those unforeseen jobs that we just take for granted. Uh, this has been a busy week at church with a funeral and our credence workshops, and you look around and our sanctuary is spotless, and so we, we, we owe uh, Susan a great deal of gratitude and, and thankfulness for your diligent, hardworking uh, efforts here, uh, keeping our church clean over these years and uh, without, without a lot of uh, thank yous, but uh, let's, let's give Susan a big... Now, I was really hoping that I wasn't going to have to beg all of you to take turns cleaning the sanctuary for the next little while, and uh, I don't have to do that. So, uh, thank, thankfully, Carol Santos has agreed uh, that's a, to take over Susan's duties as caretaker for the uh, sanctuary and education wing. Uh, Mike Santos is still staying on to do his uh, portion of the caretaking duties. So the Santos team will now be in effect, and Carol's not, not new uh, to this position. She did this before Harry and Susan uh, took that over. So Carol's back in the fold, and we really thank Carol for that, uh, agreeing to do that as well, so that we didn't have that as an extra burden on us as well. One more note, uh, part of the caretaking duties that Susan has been doing is opening the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. Um, we're going to, going to try and see if we can change that uh, around. I'm not exactly sure uh, how we're going to do that, but if there's somebody that, uh, that has a key that is willing to volunteer for that position on Sunday mornings, uh, at least to do it some of the time. Carol may be interested in doing it or able to do it some of the times. Chris has offered uh, you know, to, to pitch in where it's needed. Um, but he's not sure coming that early. Sometimes, uh, you know, I know Susan did open the sanctuary quite early, and um, sometimes it's not uh, that easy for other people. But if somebody lives close, has a key, I, I, got, I got to put you all, uh, all of you that have keys, I'm going to put you on notice because I don't know who you are, but Susan has a list. <laughs> and so, anyway, if, if there's any interest in that, please give me a show. Thanks. 
Thanks, Ken and Brenda, for sharing those things. Well, we gather here in anticipation, seeking an encounter with our holy God, who comes among us when we least expect it, who invites us to share with one another, to be radically compassionate with one another, to be merciful to one another, and to love each other well. He richly blesses us and calls us each by name. So let's worship God together this morning by standing and singing these next two songs in your hymnal, number 36, Let Us Build a House, and number 386, One is the Body. Let's stand together to sing.
And I'll invite the children to come forward for the children's story. Now, I've got something special for you guys today. I've got a special game for two brave volunteers. And the Weens kids have their hands up right away. <laughs> OK, you want you to uh, come up, and I'm going to set this up here. You get a jar of marshmallow cream. And you get a jar of marshmallow cream. You can see where this is going. It's a good start already. And uh, Julianne, can you give uh, each you and Emmett each some of these graham crackers? OK, you want to put this plate on the tablecloth here. So what we're going to do, oh, let me have two more things for you here. You need this stuff here. You have one minute to, on this plate, you're going to make something out of the graham crackers and marshmallow cream that you have there. One exact minute to build something out of gluing these pieces of graham cracker together with the marshmallow cream. And uh, whoever has, yep, you can break it up too. You can break them up into little pieces if you want. You can do with them whatever you like. Over the, over the plate, please. Thank you. <laughs> I'm already stretching things by bringing this stuff up here. But that's OK. All right, so does that make sense? Do you have any questions? When the timer starts, you may start making your thing out of graham crackers and marshmallow cream. Are you ready? Yeah, Emmett's pretty excited. OK. <laughs> whenever, whenever the video guy starts the timer, then you go. Oh, there you go. going right for the hands there. He's like, well, that, that, you, keep, you only have a minute, got to go. OK, yeah. Good start, good start. Do I give the play-by-play -play commentary? Is that what I should be doing? <laughs> I feel like Emmett's being very creative, and Julianne's being very engineer-like here. Or she's going for the basics. She's going for the basics. Emmett's going creative. Okay, yep, I see what I see what Emmett's doing there. No pressure, guys. No pressure whatsoever. Oh. The good stuff. All right. All right, this is good. So, may I see yours, Julianne? So Julianne went for the standard, you know, kind of the classic s'mores combination, which is very good. <laughs> Emmett definitely went for just his hands. And he got <laughs> kind of a building construction here. What, what were you going for here, Emmett? I don't know. You don't know. Very good. That's good. All right, big hand for these guys. I'll take care of this stuff after you. <laughs> you might have to go wash your hands, though. <laughs> All right, so... That was, uh, we were building that stuff together with uh, marshmallow cream and graham crackers. Let me grab something up here. But did you know that there is, <laughs> there you go, good job, Emmett. <laughs> did you know that there is actually a, a kind of glue that holds the cells together in your body, the cells of your skin and your organs as well? And I don't imagine any of you know what that's called. Do you know what that kind of glue is called? It is called laminin, laminins more specifically. <laughs> and uh, this is what a, a laminin molecule looks like. Can you see that picture there? What does that look like? What does that remind you of? 
DNA, kind of looks like DNA. What shape does it look like? If you had to describe the shape of a laminin molecule, what would you say, Julianne? Looks like a cross. Yeah, it does. It's like a T-shape, almost like a cross, right? Now, I don't know if God designed that specifically to look like a cross. It feels like a little bit of a stretch, maybe. Maybe it's possible. But the Bible does say this in the, uh, in the book of Colossians. The Apostle Paul writes, and he says in chapter 1, verse 17, talking about Jesus, he existed before everything else began, and he holds all creation together. So anytime that you guys might feel overwhelmed or sad or confused about something, you can trust that God is there to help you hold things together. So let's pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, help us when we are worried and we are sad to trust in you and remember that you are the Lord of everything and you hold all things together. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. You guys can go to Sunday school. Maybe clean your hands before you go to Sunday school. Well, what do you think? Is that a first? First time marshmallow cream in church on a Sunday? Uh, right now we're going to uh, take our offering. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, uh, please don't feel uh, obliged to give. This is for those of us who attend church regularly here at North Leamington. We give of what we can to support the work and the mission here at our church. Like supplying materials for our kids and their kids' ministry. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to play some music and uh, continue collecting the offering during this time. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, reading verses 22 to 31. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket 
at the thigh muscle. And I'll invite Betty to come up and share with us this morning. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be here with all of you this morning. Shortly after Christmas this year, maybe just a few days ago, I was going for a walk in my neighborhood and ran into one of my neighbors and asked her how her Christmas had been, and she said, well, I've decided I hate my sisters, but other than that, Christmas was okay. So we talked about the challenges that she had with her sisters, <clears throat> and then we parted ways. My neighbor is not alone. Wasn't it just a year ago when that book was published, when that book Spare was published? Do you remember that book? It was kind of in the news. It was Prince, hang on, Prince Harry, talking about his experience of being the spare son and the conflict that he had with his family and in particular with his brother, Prince William. Prince William and Prince Harry, my neighbor and her sisters, they're not really alone, are they? If you think about the Old Testament, there are so many, well, New Testament too, there are so many stories of siblings, communities, families of faith, where things don't go so well. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Rachel and Leah, and then Sarah and Hagar, and those are just the ones that come top of mind. There's a long history in our communities where things well, maybe it's just hard to be human with one another. Sometimes it's hard to be human with one another. And for today, we want to think about, oh, I'm just going to ask for those slides to get put up. Uh, there we go. We want to think a little bit about the story of Jacob wrestling. Well, we'll start by calling it an angel, but you'll see more about that in a minute. You remember Jacob's story, perhaps. Jacob was a twin together with his brother Esau. Esau was born first. Jacob didn't like being second born. And Jacob deceived his brother twice. Once, uh, he deceived his brother twice in order to steal a blessing, once over a pot of stew, and once when his father was giving out his blessings shortly before his death. Esau fled in fear of his life to spend time with his, brother, with his uncle Laban, where again he deceived his uncle, and in that deception decided it was time to move home again because he had ruined things with his uncle Laban, and you could say his uncle Laban ruined things with him because there was also deception on both sides of that relationship equation. So Jacob is now, we meet Jacob on his return journey, and Jacob is making his way back to his home country, and he is not pleased. He is worried, in fact. He's deeply worried because he knows when he comes home, he's going to have to meet his brother, his twin, whom he deceived. In fact, he's so worried, well, this is what the text says. He says to God, deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. And then he sends gifts, lots of gifts. He sends 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels, 30, and their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. These are not gifts that are meant to say, hey, I miss you, or I love you. These are gifts that are meant to say, please don't kill me. He is deeply, deeply afraid. And the night before he's meant to meet his brother, he knows his brother is on the horizon. He sends everybody, his whole entourage, ahead over the Jabbok River. And he spends a night alone wrestling. Wrestling. I want to talk with you about that night of wrestling because I think that night of wrestling has a lot to say to us about our own lives and the own ways, our own ways of seeking to make peace in the relationships of our lives. So to start us off, I want to share, I want to share with you two pictures. Is the Jacob, when you think about the story that Chris just read, is the Jacob that you see like this? These are the pictures that I saw in Sunday school, and this is a Jacob who is very, very strong, wrestling hard with an angel. Is this the Jacob that you think is in that story, or is the Jacob that you see more like this? And let me explain what's going on here, because it's a little hard to see. On, your, on the left, 
what you see is an angel. So that, that sort of thing that looks like a board, those are meant to be angel's wings. And the angel has long flowing hair. And you'll see that the angel must be stronger or must be taller than Jacob because the angel's knees are bent and Jacob is hanging in the, name, in the angel's arms. Jacob is wounded. He's hanging in the, name, in the angel's arms. And you'll see that one of his legs is bent. That is the leg that is wounded. Jacob is spent. Is the Jacob that you see like this, strong and powerful, or like this, wounded, desperate, and broken? Sometimes when I share this image with congregations, they say, well, Betty, he maybe started like this, and maybe he ended like this. I'm not sure, but I would propose to you that Jacob could not have met his brother Esau, at least not well, if he had not spent that night wrestling. And we want to take apart a little bit of what happened on that night. And to begin, I want to do a very short short biblical studies lesson with you, and that is there are keys to understanding Old Testament scripture and New Testament, actually. And this key is what we might describe as uh, a poetic structure. Remember that most of the Old Testament was oral history until it was written down. And so these stories of Jacob wrestling and Jacob with his brother, they were oral stories. And how do you help people from one generation to the next remember something? Well, you put it in a structure so that it's easier to remember. And so in the biblical text, frequently what you will see is this kind of a pattern, A, B, C, B, A, or A, B, C, D, C, B, A. When you go to university today and you write an essay, the professor will teach you that you need to put your thesis statement right there in the first paragraph, or if you're writing a book, maybe in the first chapter, the introduction. Your thesis statement leads out and everything follows. In this structure, the thesis statement is right in the middle, letter D. We build towards the thesis statement and then build beyond, down from it. It's like a piece of poetry. And sometimes the text is A, A, B, B, C, C, a different kind of poetry, but that kind of poetry helps people to remember. But the reason it's important for us is that the piece that you're most intended to pay attention to is D. We're going to get to D in a minute. But before we do, just something that's a bit amusing, that in the Hebrew text, there are no names that are accidental. The word for wrestling in Hebrew is jabok. So Jacob jabokt at the jabok. It's a play on words. And those, I don't know Hebrew really, but those who do find the text, the scripture, fascinating. Because there's tons of little plays on words, little jokes not in an irreverent way, but in a very meaningful way. The land that when Jacob crosses into the region of his family of origin, the word for that, the land, is another word for twin. In other words, it's a foreshadowing of the encounter with his twin that he's about to have. So here, Jacob jabbocks at the jabbock. But let's look at the text that Chris read for us. It follows a really simple A, B, C, D, C, B, A structure. Jacob wrestled with a man. At the end, he recognized it was God. We, in history, in art, we always think of Jacob as wrestling with an angel. But that's not what the text says. The text says he wrestles with a man, and in the end, he recognizes it was God. There's a wound, there's a wound, there's a request for blessing, there's a blessing, that's the B. Tell me your name, you shall be called Israel. And in the middle, my name is Jacob. My name is Jacob. That's the thesis statement. I would like to build towards that, but before we do, I'd like to start with letter B. Bless me. Jacob spends a night wrestling with this man. He wrestles, and he wrestles hard. He will, in fact, the text says he prevails. He won't let go. And then he asks for a blessing. The man wants to be let go, and Jacob says, bless me. Why is this important? Note, we are about to, Jacob is about to meet his brother, the person from whom he stole a blessing. Not once, but twice. Jacob's only, even his uncle Laban, from whom he received other blessings, those too were stolen. Jacob has never in his life had a blessing that wasn't stolen. And so for the first time in his life, he's desperate for a blessing that isn't stolen. 
And so he knows that if he's going to meet his brother from whom he stole a blessing, he has to get a legitimate blessing first. So he wrestles hard through the night, desperate for a blessing. But this man doesn't give him a blessing. We miss this when we skip over the text, but the man doesn't actually give him a blessing. He says to him, tell me your name. Tell me your name. And in this moment, you should think that Jacob is wincing. Why? There is only one other time in Jacob's life that someone asked him his name. When? Exactly, his father. When he goes to his dressed up like Esau, right? He puts some fur on his skin to make himself look hairy. And dressed up like Esau, he goes to his father, and his father is a bit confused because it doesn't seem right. And his father says, tell me your name. And he lies. He says, my name is Esau. And so here, he's wrestling for the blessing. This man that he's wrestling with doesn't give him the blessing. He says to him, tell me your name. And in that moment, the deception that Jacob has lived is absolutely front and center. And we should see Jacob wincing. Whoops. And in that moment, Jacob says, my name is Jacob. My name is Jacob. Again, in Hebrew and in the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, There is no name, there is no title for anything that's accidental. What does the name Jacob mean? The deceiver, the crooked one. And so when he says, my name is Jacob, he says, I am the deceiver. It's like somebody coming to you and saying, tell me your name. And you say, well, my name is the person who comes late for meetings. Or, my name is the person who doesn't know how to be kind to my sister or my brother. That's the kind of confession that we should feel in this moment. It reminds me, some years ago, I was asked to give a talk at a, um, something, a group that's similar to Alcohol Anonymous. It's not, but similar to that. So I, and I was sitting in the sanctuary, and I was listening as people made their introductions And when they got up to the mic to speak, they would say their name, and then they would say, I am a, and they would confess their sin, whatever, or they would confess their their addiction, I guess would be more accurate. They would confess their addiction before they went on to give whatever talk they gave. I thought, oh, how fascinating. They were just like Jacob in this text. I am, I am Jacob. I am the deceiver. I am the addicted one. I am the one who's been addicted to being crooked, to being full of deception. Jacob confesses. And then, although this, my name is Jacob, is the center of the text, after the confession, we feel or we see this great, great surprise. Because the man says to them, Jacob, you've got this all wrong. You don't need to be the deceiver. That was an illusion. You get to be called Israel. And most of us think of Israel as meaning the father of many. But actually, in Hebrew, Israel means straight. Do you know from the Hallelujah, uh, from the Ma- Handel's Messiah, some of you will know Handel's Messiah, there's that chorus, the crooked shall be made straight. That is, Jacob shall be made Israel. Jacob means crooked, Israel means straight. And so what we see here is that this man comes to him and says, no, 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 you don't need to be the deceiver. You don't need to be the deceiver. You can be the straight one. You can be the one who does not deceive. I will give you a new name. I will call you Israel, the one who is straight, the one who does not deceive. And so he gives them this new identity, and then, almost as an afterthought, he says, oh, by the way, here's the blessing. Here's the blessing. You don't, it it, it was never about the blessing, really. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. Because what it was about was that Jacob believed 
He believed that he could only be worthy by deception. And this man that he's wrestling with says, no, no, you already are blessed. Here's your blessing. You don't need to be the deceiver. And upon receiving the blessing, all of a sudden, he is surprised. It's God. Here I thought this whole time I was wrestling with a man. It's God I've been wrestling with. He didn't notice it until he received the blessing. But if you go into the Hebrew scripture and you, and you look at the construction of the Hebrew, it's quite possible it's to interpret the text that when he begins that night of wrestling, the man he is wrestling with is himself. It's himself that he starts wrestling, where he starts his night of wrestling. He's wrestling with himself. And God looks on him and says, oh, dear Jacob, I love you so much that I'm going to be your wrestling partner with you. You don't need to wrestle alone. I love you so much that I will wrestle with you. How many of you have had this experience where you say something to a family member, to a friend, a colleague, maybe somebody at church, maybe at a meeting, you go home at night and think, ah, why, why did I say that? Why did I do it that way? And, and it's not the first time I've said it incorrectly. Why do I get stuck like this? And then you can't sleep because at night you wake up and it just, it's, you wrestle. Why am I like this? If, am I the only one who's had that experience? We, we know this experience. We know what it's like to be in Jacob's shoes, spending a night wrestling with ourselves, desperate to be somebody other than we're not, than we are. And the good news in this moment is that when we spend that night wrestling alone, we're not alone. There is this great, great grace of God looking and coming towards us and saying, I, I love you so much. I'm not going to leave you alone in this hard wrestling. I will be your wrestling partner with you, and I will give you a new name. I will give you a new name. And what's fascinating about this text, of course, is there's this business of the wound. Why does Jacob get wounded, and why do we have this repeat about the wound at the end of the text? How many of you, after a night of wrestling, feel like you've been a bit scarred? Most of us, don't we? And we might walk with a limp after a hard night of wrestling. And I'd like to think that those wounds that we carry actually make us a little bit more beautiful, don't they? I, <laughs> I remember um, talking with uh, somebody uh, once about a book that I was reading. I mentioned this book yesterday. The title of the book is Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. I was writing about this book, or talking about this book. And if, this woman that I know said, oh, I don't think I need to read that book. I never make mistakes. And her husband said, yeah, yeah, she's, she's very thoughtful. She never makes mistakes. And I thought, I don't know how to relate to you. I, I make so many mistakes. Like, it, it's hard to be friends with someone who never makes mistakes. How, do we, how can we be in the presence of someone who's perfect? Being in the presence of someone who's perfect means there's not a lot of space for us, is there? Because we are all broken and beautifully broken individuals. We are beautiful and we are broken. And those wounds that we carry are part of our beauty because they tell us and the world around us, yes, we have spent nights wrestling and we have emerged wounded and beautiful. Wounded and beautiful. And what's interesting is I sometimes think that that wound is also a bit of wake-up call for us. Because Jacob, Israel, when he walks, he walks with a limp. And every time that limp gives him a poke of pain, it's a reminder, Jacob, Jacob, remember, you're not Jacob anymore, you're Israel. It's a reminder. And most, almost every, you know, in the 
biblical text, it's frequent to get a new name. Sarai becomes Sarah, Abram becomes Abraham. This new name thing is common. Paul becomes, Saul becomes Paul. Jacob is one of the only characters where it goes back and forth between Jacob and Israel. And some people go suggest that that's because he didn't always live in, a, in accordance to his new name. He went back and forth. And he needed the limp to remind him to live by his new name. To remind him he had already spent that night wrestling. And he was invited to live by the new name that he had been given. My name is Jacob. My name is Jacob. You will be called Israel. I invite you to take a few moments just to meditate on this image of Jacob. I invite you to recall your own nights of wrestling and your personal experiences, your encounters with God, however mundane or profound they have been. What happened to you in your nights of wrestling? How did these experiences impact you then? And in retrospect, how do they impact you now? And if, like Jacob, you met God during a night of wrestling, what name would you be asked to confess? And what new name might you be given? And Jacob also stand, is a stand-in for a peoplehood if, like Jacob, this congregation met God in a night of wrestling, what name collectively as a congregation would you be asked to confess or release? And what name collectively might you as a congregation be given? These are hard questions because, of course, we might not agree with one another about what we're asked to release and what we're asked to receive. But I believe that wrestling with God, with ourselves, and collectively wrestling with God makes us more beautiful, not less beautiful. What name are you being asked to receive? What name are you being asked to release? Yesterday I said to the group, there are three things, three realities upon which you can rely. God's love and grace, into these you are born. And suffering will come. We encounter loss and sorrow and brokenness, broken community. And in our suffering, there's a hand that reaches towards us that seeks to bring us, to draw us back into life. Years ago, I was reading a book, and the author talked about how you need to, everybody needs to have two pockets and a rock in each pocket, a stone. And in the left, in one pocket, you pull out the stone that says and reminds you, oh, you are beautiful and beloved and perfect exactly as you are. The world was made for you. And the other pocket, you pull out the stone that reminds you that you are broken, you are a worm, you are complicated, you are difficult. And this rabbi said, you need both of these at all times, because both are true. God's love and grace is true. You are beautiful and beloved. And brokenness will come. It is part of life's journey. And in the midst of our brokenness, there's a hand that reaches towards us, that pulls us again and again, like the angel or a god wrestling with Jacob pulling Jacob back into life, pulling us back into life. And so God's love is consistent, even for you, also for you as a congregation. And so we sometimes are asked as congregations to confess our name, 
and collectively we're invited to reach towards the hand that is already reaching towards us. Now some people ask me, but Betty, what happened after Jacob had that night of wrestling? What happened next? We know that when Jacob finished that night of wrestling, the next day he crossed the river Jabbok, he met his brother Esau, and it was a beautiful reconciliation. They spent time together. They fell into each other's arms. And then they promised to see each other again, and they never did, at least not as far as this biblical story goes. Did they see each other again, and it's just not recorded? That's possible. It's also possible that given the pain between them, the reconciliation was enough, and they weren't able to walk together into their future. They needed to walk separate ways. That's also possible, but it doesn't take away from the goodness of the reconciliation. What we know is that for Jacob and for Esau, God's embrace remains. God's embrace remains. I want to close by reading Psalm 139 as a story, as a poem, a psalm for each one of us of God's grace remaining for each one of us. You have searched us, Lord, and you know us. You know when we sit and when we rise. You perceive our thoughts from afar. You discern our going out and our lying down. You are familiar with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem us in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon us. You lay your hand upon us. Amen. Seem to have misplaced my copy of the program. Can I steal someone else's? Thank you, John. I just wouldn't want to direct you to singing the wrong song. Thank you, Betty, for your words today and for reminding us of the embrace of God. Let's stand together and sing number 778, Will You Let Me Be Your Servant?
We have some time to share any prayer requests that you may have, items of concern or items of celebration. Anything you would like prayer for, please feel free to raise your hand and Jason will make sure. Oh, there we go. Hi, Brenda Fisher. Um, we had my father's funeral this past week and our uncle Dave and his son Arn flew in from Saskatchewan. They have gone home already and our uncle Henry and our cousin Gerald flew in also and they are still here with us this morning. So thanks for being with us. Gerald and I are very grateful to be a part of this service, to have been a part of uh, my brother's uh, funeral. What I really wanted to thank you for all the years of your support that we've been uh, working in the Native community since 1952. Then in 55, we went with Native Ministries and you have supported us uh, very much. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for all that support and that the Lord may continue to bless us all as we seek to uh, fill the place that he has for us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Henry, I had a chance to talk about some of the, the stories of your experiences uh, up north during John Newfield's memorial. In the children's story, Chris, you said, when we are worried and sad, know that God is holding everything together. And at this time, when we no longer have the candles at the front of the church, there is a candle that is hard to keep going. It's a candle of hope. And sometimes it's hard to remember that God is holding everything together. And so I'd like to ask for prayer for the people in Palestine who are trying to keep that candle of hope alight, that the occupation will truly come to an end. Thank you, Barbara. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we give you all of our burdens this day and all of our joys. We bring to you the deepest yearnings of our hearts, the things that take up our minds through the week, the things that distract us and we can find ourselves obsessing over and focusing on because of passion, because of drive, because we care for others, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you hold these things up that are on our hearts and on our minds. Help us to journey through them. Help us to work them out. We give you thanks for places where family have come together to support one another through difficult times. And we ask that you're with us and our larger family in the world as we proceed to go through even more difficult and terrible times. Lord, help us to understand what that means to hold us together. Help us to understand how we can incarnate this in our lives, how we can do this in our relationships with others, especially when life is threatened or things seem difficult or hatred seems on the rise. Help us to be your people of peace in the world around us this week and help us to especially focus on your spirit of peace as we begin 2024. And I pray these things in your son's name, amen. Let's stand together and sing one more song, number 813, Heart with Loving Heart United. Let's stand.
please join with me in reading this benediction as we go to lunch or go out together. As we leave this place, we know God will be with us wherever we go. At work or play, at home or on vacation, we know God will be with us wherever we go. Whether we're happy or sad, on our own or with our friends, we know God will be with us wherever we go. So let's go with joy, because God goes with us. Go in peace this morning.